Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is a, a workshop on uh, the regulation of standard essential patents has been organi organized by the Center for the Digital Society of the European University Institute. Uh, this workshop is uh, uh, will uh, is timely because we'll discuss uh, the recent proposal of the European Commission of a new regulation for standard essential patents. Uh, for us, this part, this discussion is part of our project, uh, of one of our projects of research on intellectual property that we are conducting in the past few years. And uh, we have been following uh, both the standard essential patents, uh, patents in general, and the innovation process in the digital society. So I'm very interested in this discussion. Uh, I will come back uh, for some conclusion, but I will refrain from any, uh, from any, uh, taking any position right now, because uh, this discussion will be conducted by Igor Nikolic, that's our research fellow and is a specialist of the uh, intellectual property discussion and has been uh, with us uh, for this uh, research project. Igor will introduce the regulation and then we'll conduct the discussion with uh, an extremely qualified panel that uh, he will introduce. Igor, you have the floor, thank you. Thank you very much, Pierluigi. And I would like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. And also special thanks to our panelists for accepting to participate. I would like to use the first maybe 10 or so minutes just to set the scene for the debate in our panel. So I will first introduce a bit the reasons for the commission to propose this regulation. I will then explain the aims it wishes to pursue and some basic content of the regulation. And then I'll ask some, set the stage by asking questions that we will discuss during the panel. So I'm sure that probably all of you are aware of the regulation and what it contains, but nevertheless, here is a bit of a summary. So the commission on 27th of April a proposed regulation on standard essential patents. So why have the regulation in this area? So according to commission, there are inefficiencies in licensing of SAPs. For one, there are high transaction costs and licensing uncertainties. And the commission's impact assessment calculated that on average, bilateral negotiations cost between two to 11 million per license. And that's a cost both for the SAP owners and implementers. And then licensing uncertainty, according to the commission, is because there is insufficient transparency on SAP ownership and essentiality. There is a lack of information about what are the brand terms. And dispute resolution system is inadequate for brand determinations. And the next challenge according to the commission, is the rise of IoT markets who are using ICT standards more and more. And the challenge there is that there are many use cases and then many applications with not high enough volumes and low profit margins. So it's difficult to, to pay royalties in these many use cases. And also IoT companies are not adept to, to SAP licensing. And finally, according to the commission, there is a special problem with SMEs. SMEs are not well equipped. Uh, they don't have experience with SAP licensing and they don't have the money to go into this expensive negotiation and litigation. So the regulation wants to achieve three aims. It wishes to make standards available to users and SMEs. It wants the EU to become the leader in standard innovation. And it wants to encourage both SAP owners and implementers to innovate and make products and services available on best standardized technologies and EU be competitive on a global stage. And we will discuss today if this is achievable and what is the view 
about of the panel of those aims. Now, as to the content of the regulation, there are a few big, big areas which the regulation now uh, regulates. So first, there will be competence center set up before the EU IPO, and this competence center will be responsible for two databases, the SAP register and the SAP da database. So what's the difference? Well, the SAP owners will be required to register their patents they believe are essential for a standard to this competence center. And SAP register will hold some basic information like the name of a patent, what standard it, it reads, ownership information. And SAP database will include more in-depth information, for example, about friend royalty determinations for those SAPs, essentiality checks, uh, possible claim charts, litigation, and so on. Important thing is that according to the regulation, an SAP that is not registered may not be enforced before courts in the EU. Also, the SAP owner will not be entitled to receive royalties or seek damages for infringement until it registers SAPs. So this is kind of a limitation on the patent owner's rights. The second novelty is introduction of essentiality checks. So the EU IPO, the Competence Center, will annually select a sample of SAPs from the register to check for essentiality. And this sample will be from each SAP owner from a specific standard. And the idea is to get an essentiality ratio per standard and also per SAP owner. Also, each SAP owner may voluntarily propose annually to check up to 100 registered SAPs and implementers can do the same. The regulation provides that these assessments are non-binding, but obviously uh, the idea, the intention is to have persuasive value before courts and also in the industry. Then, in order to have a price transparency, the Commission wants to create a process where companies, where it would be known how much the standard costs, what is the total price of a standard. And to arrive to this total price, the Commission suggests first, first that SAP owners jointly notify the aggregate royalty rate. And as far as I understand from the regulation, consensus is not required. So it may be possible that many different groups of SAP owners notify their different views on the aggregate royalty rate. Then there is the possibility uh, of a conciliator if SAP owners cannot reach an agreement to help them arrive at a joint aggregate royalty rate. And finally, a third process is a uh, non-binding expert opinion on global aggregate royalty rate. And this process can be initiated by any SAP owner or any implementer. And the regulation provides how this procedure will go on. And finally, there is a process of mandatory friend determination. What does it mean? So before starting a litigation in the EU, there has to be a mandatory friend determination process before the EU IPO. So this process can be initiated by both parties, by SAP owner before initiating SAP infringement in the EU or implementer before having request for determination of friend terms. So this process ideally should last for nine months. And also the regulation includes a lot of details how this process should be conducted, the rules of evidence, and also what happens if one party is silent, doesn't accept to participate in this process. And one important thing to keep in mind is that this process can be conducted even if only one party participates. So this is kind of an incentive for both parties to try their best and participate in this process. Now, interestingly enough, the regulation doesn't prevent parallel proceedings in third countries. 
So it may be possible that there is litigation going on outside of the EU simultaneously with this process. But if that happens upon request of any party, this friend determination process will terminate. So there is this is kind of in regulation a way how to avoid this mandatory friend determination. In the end, if the process is not terminated or parties do not settle, there will be a report of the conciliator, one public, one confidential, and this confident uh, and this public report on confidential will be published in the SAP database. So that's the content of the regulation very briefly. Now, to set the scene and ask questions for the panel and to express my own doubts about this regulation. So I'm thinking, is there really a need to regulate in this area? So what is the evidence? that we have and the commission collected. And interestingly enough, if you look at the study that was commissioned by the European Commission about empirical assessment of potential challenges in SAP licensing. And while reading this study, I found that according to the authors, the prevalence of SAP litigation is low and it is not increasing over time. And they found actually that the share of SAPs that are litigated is decreasing. So yes, there is some litigation, but over time, it seems there is no explosion of, of litigation. Furthermore, the authors try to measure what is the impact of this licensing uncertainty on SAP owners and implementers. And they found there is no evidence that SAP owners are contributing less to standard development. They also find no evidence that implementers are choosing alternative standards. Those are standards without a plan commitment. And overall, they find no indication that current SAP licensing system is depressing or delaying standard implementation. And then I ask the question, if there is no evidence of the market failure by the commission study, do we really need the regulation? And also another interesting question from my side, do we know how many standards will be caught? And the commission impact assessment includes an estimated of over 75,000 patent families. They haven't seen any number of standards and SDOs that are potentially caught by this uh, regulation. And the impact assessment mentions a study from 2010, which looks at the standards in an average standards in a laptop, which finds that there were 148 friend standards in a laptop back in 2010. So do we know what are all these standards? Why are they all included in the regulation? Because in my view, throughout this debate about SCPs, often only a few standards have been mentioned as allegedly problematic. Those are 3G, 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi. But what about 140 other standards? Are they also problematic? Are the licensing problems with all of them that we also need to regulate? Uh, another one of my, my, my questions is about the cost of this regulation. And this is the impact assessment from the commission. And as you can see, the benefits, proposed benefits of this regulation will go mostly to one side, to SAP implementers, and all of the costs, as you can see, will go to SAP owners. And then I wonder, can we have some system where costs and benefits are more balanced? Uh, the commission itself notes in the impact assessment that actually estimating precisely cost and benefits is difficult. And that actually the effects of regulation may go in both ways. It may lead to more licensing and therefore increasing the cost to implementers, but also the revenues to SAP owners. But it can go the other way, lowering the royalties, which mean lowering the cost to implementers, but also less income to SAP owners. So the commission is ambiguous about what precisely effects this regulation will have on the markets. And the question about also about SMEs. So 
one of the aims of this disregulation is to protect SMEs. And the Commission, uh, in its public consultation, received uh, responses from nine SMEs and conducted a special SME survey targeted at SMEs and collected only 37 responses. And then, to me, it's a bit puzzling if it's a problem as if SAP licensing is a problem to SMEs, why is it so difficult to collect opinions from them? Or why more representative sample wasn't obtained? And is it enough to have regulatory action based on responses of 1% of SMEs? And if there is such a low response from SMEs, perhaps we should think maybe of some alternative ways of how to protect them besides regulation. Finally, there can be many more questions. One is, will the regulation achieve its goals? Uh, what about unintended effects? Will the litigation now move outside of the EU and then does de defeat the purpose of this legislation? And what about the geopolitical responses? Can we imagine a world where different countries also have their own SAP regulation with their own SAP registers, essentiality checks, brand determination. What may happen then? Will we see a regulatory competition and a shift from courts to regulators in SAP disputes? So many questions, and I would like to thank my panelists for accepting to come and share their views. So we have Professor Jorge Contreras from Utah University, Alexander Prenter from Fair Standards Alliance, Michael Schlogo from Continental, Ushka Petrovic from Qualcomm, and Richard Berry, a lawyer from Bird and Bird. And this is where I stop talking and leave the floor to my panelists. And I would like to start and ask first, first Professor Contreras. Professor, what do you think about this regulation? What are your thoughts? Did we need it? Do we need it? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this, uh, you know, very distinguished uh, panel. Um, so I have a uh, mixed reaction to the proposed regulation. I am, of course, a U.S. Uh, legal academic, and I'm viewing this sort of from an international standpoint as opposed to a purely European standpoint. So there are four parts to the proposal, as you've mentioned, the registry, the essentiality checking, the aggregate rate opinion, and the friend rate determination. And honestly, I think that two of these are particularly useful, and I think they do fill a need in the market. And the first is the aggregate rate determination. And the aggregate rate is important because, as you know, in multi-jurisdictional FRAND litigation today, different courts in different countries who are adjudicating uh, these disputes can produce radically different rates, um, including uh, courts within the same country, as we see in the United States, um, uh, making determinations of FRAND rates, even on the same standard, the same products, and so forth. Um, and, and so this sort of inconsistency is bad from a planning perspective and from a market um, efficiency and transparency perspective. So top-down royalty determinations are useful in addressing this problem. Top-down determinations look at the aggregate value that all the patented technology in a standard contributes both to the standard and to the standardized product, and then allocates that aggregate value among the SEP holders and several courts, as we know, in the US and the UK, Japan, have adopted variants of this approach. But those approaches, they've been criticized for many reasons, um, including the lack of information that goes into them. Um, Top-down determinations are difficult to do in a bilateral litigation between two parties, especially when you have standards like the um, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G series that have hundreds of holders of SEPs. Only two are speaking in any bilateral litigation. So a collective approach with evidence from all the stakeholders, both the SEP holders and the implementers is very useful. And this proposed EU IPO procedure would offer a pathway for that kind of thing to happen 
independently of bilateral litigation. Um, I think it's quite useful because the expert opinion that the, um, that the agency uh, produces would be published to provide guidance for others. Um, and it's also intended to be very inclusive of all of the stakeholders. And, and so far, we haven't seen this type of uh, joint procedure uh, implemented in any country. And part of the reason is because of uh, competition law complaints and concerns that have been raised. I think the uh, EU stepping forward and saying that this type of aggregate royalty um, calculation is useful and uh, the EU IPO facilitated is, is very useful. The second piece that I think is useful is the FRAND rate determination piece. It's, I think, not perfect, but a step in the right direction. And the problem that this is addressing, in my view, is the global jurisdictional competition in FRAND litigation cases among not just parties, but courts in the UK, China, the US, Germany, um, and a number of other countries in which courts and parties in those courts have been racing to get favorable judgments uh, uh, for the uh, for the FRAND rate, whether the implementer or the SEP holder, and then have those rates be applied to a global license that would then moot the other proceedings in other countries. So this, you know, any anyone who has studied law at all knows that this will result inevitably in forum shopping, strategic and opportunistic behavior. Um, which is enabled by this uncoordinated system of global litigation. And, and this opportunism, um, of course, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't help uh, some parties. It's especially unfavorable to SMEs. And in fact, even more importantly, has led to international uh, controversy and friction, just pointing to the EU's complaint against China at the World Trade Organization, which other countries have now joined in as well, as a spate of protectionist US legislation that's been proposed directly to address this issue. So the EU's proposal does not solve this problem, but it is at least a step in the right direction. One thing it does is this nine month period uh, that, that uh, must be gone through uh, before litigation is brought in Europe will help avoid the rapid race to get an injunction in countries that issue injunctions uh, very readily and very quickly um, on an incomplete record. And, and so that I think um, alone uh, will introduce some um, greater deliberation and fairness to the process. The second thing that it does that I think is very important is it establishes a recognized rate setting mechanism in the EU that will be recognized globally. Um, at, at, Courts in every country, every jurisdiction will know about this. And so in the spirit of international comity, uh, my expectation is that courts in other countries, whether they're China or the UK um, or other non-EU countries, uh, will respect the fact that the EU is coming up with its own rate determination and will not try to set a global rate uh, that will differ from that EU determination. In fact, what I would hope to see is those foreign judgments would simply defer to this um, EU panel determination or whatever the determination may be in the EU. So I think those are very helpful. I mean, that being said, I, I think there are still some drawbacks um, in the proposal. Uh, one of them is transparency. And even though the methodology of this rate determination will be made public, the results themselves will still be confidential. Um, and that I think is not helpful for the industry broadly. I think if the panel is putting in the effort to uh, gather evidence and come up with a rate, it should be publicized what that rate is, just like it is in any court proceeding. Um, a second issue is that this, uh, while the aggregate rate determination does include all stakeholders by design, the FRAND rate determination doesn't. It's still structured as a bilateral dispute resolution mechanism, not a collective rate setting exercise. And again, I think that leaving out the other stakeholders um, leaves evidence out of the calculation that would be better to include. 
Um, it's not binding even on the parties, which again, I can understand the legal reasons for this, but this I do think weakens the force of the, of the determination. Although again, one would hope that a national court in Europe would at least give some respect and credence to what the EU IPO determines. Although it's extremely predictable that the party who is least happy with that outcome will argue vehemently that it's flawed in many ways and then defeat the purpose uh, to some degree. And finally, there's really no discouragement of anti-suit injunctions in other countries, the sort of thing that some of this protective US legislation has been directed at. And so, um, you know, that I think uh, is an opportunity that has been missed here. Um, the final thing I'll say is just in response to Igor's observation about the 148 uh, standards and this being over-inclusive, I, I think that um, the the uh, commission was careful to make sure that didn't happen. I, Article 1, Part 4 um, clearly says that uh, they can exclude standards from the ambit of the, uh, the procedure if, it, if the, there have not been observed significant difficulties or inefficiencies in the licensing of those standards. So I do think this will be the handful of standards that uh, have been the subject of extensive litigation around the world. They're very important standards with large adoption. And I, I do think that at least a couple of these procedures that are in the proposal can be helpful to, um, to make things more efficient, more fair uh, worldwide. So thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, Alex, what can you tell us? What are your, your views on the regulation? Yeah, thanks, Igor. Um, thanks for the invitation to speak today. Um, so for Fair Standards Alliance, for those who do not know, we uh, a trade association based in Brussels. We have 47 members. Our membership is very diverse, uh, includes uh, companies such as automotive. And I'd like to thank Michael for being here as well today to represent the automotive perspective. But we also have broadcasting, consumer electronics, semiconductors, smart metering and telecommunications who have all decided to join FSA um, because collectively under the umbrella of FSA, our members are concerned around uh, you know, SCP licensing. Um, I'll say like an anecdotal, anecdotal point I'll make is that our membership keeps continue to grow um, as more and more sectors uh, encounter connectivity standards in particular, more and more companies are saying, hang on, this doesn't make sense. This seems to be unfair. And so they look to us to join us. I'd like to say that, you know, to point out as well that collectively our members invest you know, more than 180 billion euros into R&D every year. So our, our members are some of the most innovative companies in the world. Um, and they are, those investments are directed towards products and services that you're using every day to make your lives better. And those investments are protected and incentivized by intellectual property. So, you know, we, we do a survey and in the aggregate, our members have more than 600,000 patents and that includes many tens of thousands of patents uh, related, to stand, uh, related to standards. So our, our members are heavily involved in standardization. So for our members, the FCP regulation is a welcome initiative from the commission. We still have many questions. So please forgive me if I can't speak you know, to the nitty gritty of every article today, but I can say with confidence, uh, despite some of the headlines out there, um, that in fact, FSA and its members do welcome the SCP regulation as a step in the right direction. Of course, you know, between now and when the regulation is finally passed, a lot is going to change. So of course it's you know, outcome determinative whether we will support it at the end, but uh, for now we are supportive. Uh, we'll be working very dil diligently with our members uh, over the next months to understand the contours of the regulation and to see how it can be improved. Um, I think what we can say, what we see that is good about the regulation is that it, it makes a good attempt to address many of the concerns which we've been raising um, over the past years. And I think those concerns, well, for those who know FSA, those concerns are quite well known, but in general, these relate to what we consider to be the misuse of injunctions, um, the refusal to offer licenses on friend terms to certain companies, and other behaviors involved in the, in the negotiation process, which point to a lack of transparency. 
Now, does the regulation address everything for us or does it solve everything? No, of course not. I don't think anybody could actually expect it to. With that said, uh, it does attempt to address, and I think in a substantive manner, some of the key concerns around transparency. And as Professor Contreras um, made, uh, pointed out, the, the system for a frame determination without the threat of, a litig without the threat of litigation is really, uh, really important for us. It also opens the door for companies who want to get a license to be able to get one where they've previously been refused a license. Does it go as far as we might like? Uh, well, no, but I think that is a reflection of the fact that the commission has made a genuine attempt to balance the interests of licensors and licensees. So from that perspective, I'd like to thank the commission for trying to strike this balance. Um, and I think the proposal is a reflect, good reflection of, of, of the concerns from both sides. And finally, for my opening statement, I'd like to underscore the fact that we shouldn't be looking at the SCP regulation in isolation. I see you know, a lot of comments on social media saying that this is going to be the end of Europe, you know, European innovation and whatnot. I think these claims are <laughs> massively out, overblown. I think we should all you know, just take, take a step and uh, get some perspective on this. The European Commission in the last years has clearly signaled that Europe needs to improve its competitiveness to ensure our collective prosperity going forward. And I think the basis for that prosperity for the last 150 years has been European manufacturing. So we make good stuff in Europe and we shouldn't be afraid to say that and we need to preserve that. So I think from that perspective, the regulation does support the commission's broader goals of improving Europe's uh, position internationally you know, with, in terms of its manufacturing base and it makes us more competitive overall. So with that, I'd like to, you know, I'll finish here, but I'm happy to discuss more about the regulation uh, moving forward. Oh, actually, finally, on the point Igor made about the SMEs, um, I think the Commission struggles to get feedback from the SMEs because SMEs have a lot of other things to be doing than answering a survey from the European Commission. And I would also say that that survey that the Commission put out was very technical. The SMEs do not employ people like me to go through answering those surveys. Yeah, so it's, it comes as no surprise uh, to me that they have such a small sample size. With that said, SMEs, when they go to their, you know, their, their suppliers, when they go to buy a chipset or a module, they expect their supplier to have solved all these issues for them. It's, it's only, it seems to be with a small subset of standards where it's, oh, you, you, pay, you buy your, your product and then pay another fee later on. I'll finish there. Uh, I'll let the others speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, Michael, what are your thoughts? Yes, uh, so I'm Michael Schlügel. I'm head of IPSEP for Continental. I am also Etsy board member, and uh, I have to make uh, right now a disclaimer. So what I present today is, of course, not uh, the uh, position of Etsy as, as an organization or the Etsy board. So it's it's my, my own personal capacity I'm speaking here in. And, uh, first of all, I mean, I, I would like to support actually both of, 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 of the speakers before me, uh, Alex and, and also Jorge. I mean, Alex said it's a problem for SMEs. But to be honest, I mean, this, 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 this licensing problem is not just a problem for SMEs. Also for, you know, decent mid-sized and even big companies, if they are not deep into the SEP market, it's indeed a problem to understand the complexity of SEP licensing. And maybe I, I uh, should give you a short overview from where we are coming. I prepared a presentation and I can try to share it right now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So um, here, I mean, I'm pretty sure everybody knows what an SCP is, but I would like to, to you know, to, to come really back when we talk about this to the basics. And I mean, standard essential patterns from my perspective are patterns, first of all, like any other, these are patterns, but with a little commitment. So this is the friend commitment and the friend commitment from my perspective 
is, is a limitation. So somehow the impact of, of these patents should be limited by the commitment. Why is this? Because in the standard setting process, we have a critical situation. We have competitors working together and they are discussing about technical solutions together. It's a Nokia, it's an Ericsson, it's a Qualcomm and a Huawei. They come together and they select technical solutions out of you know, a variety of, of possible technical solutions. That's necessary to, you know, to make devices to, to interoperable. I, 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 am, I fully agree and that, that that's useful for, 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 for all of us. But on the other hand, it gives the uh, SEP owner when he protects this selected technical solution, it gives them, you know, a lot of power because a design around, and we see this in, uh, especially in, in the Etsy standards, like three, four, five G, and a design around is technically possible, but you will not be any more standard compliant. And that's why we need the friend commitment. And the friend commitment is of course a bit of an art artificial thing, but it's meant or it's introduced to somehow substitute regular market forces. And these regular market force, which I'm missing here in the, in the SEP uh, licensing world is indeed the option of design around. What does it mean in, in, in litigation and in the courtrooms? Indeed, we have these so-called problematic standards and they are mostly 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. So here we see really the concentration of litigation. This is a study from IPLytics. And uh, we have other standards, and we already discussed this. They are absolutely unproblematic. We have those standards also in the auto industry to mention this. We have, for example, a CAN bus, we have AutoZAR, or we have PSI5. These are standards royalty bearing some of them but without any problems in in, in litigation or frictions in in, in the friend, friend licensing what we have seen is uh, frictions indeed and you all know this we had heavy litigations in the automotive industry for four years now uh, we have seen this uh, in, in in the context of, of uh, 4g 3 and 4g and one of the most impressive examples here from my perspective is indeed the IP bridge versus fault litigation. So here we have seen in the auto industry one patent. This is EP737, which is most likely valid, which is most likely essential. But I can tell you this patent is not a genius invention. It's a small patent with a very little inventive step. Why can I say this? Because we developed, by the way, uh, with the help of our supplier, a uh, design around. So from a technical perspective, it's easy to substitute this patent with another technical solution. But unfortunately, the OEM, the customer of Continental, uh, uh, yeah, Ford Berger GmbH and Ford, Ford Motor Corporation, they did not want to have a substitute. They wanted to comply with uh, the standard and therefore they did not accept the design around. As a consequence, when especially the Munich court in, was inclined to grant the injunction, uh, Ford indeed entered into negotiations with uh, with IP Bridge. And from my perspective, the logical solution for this you know, dispute would have been a, a license contract between IP Bridge and Ford Werke GmbH. But Ford Werke GmbH was actually not the target of, uh, of IP Bridge. IP Bridge insisted on a contract with Ford Motor Corporation. So the mother of Ford Werke GmbH, which actually was not the defendant in this case. And here, Ford was, I would say, generous and said, okay, let's have a global contract uh, for, for Ford's global sales with IP Bridge. And here again, IP Bridge rejected and said, no, that's not enough for us. We don't want to see a bilateral contract. We want to see you signing an Avanci contract. And from my perspective, the pool solution was always optional. So you can decide for a pool contract, but you also can 
you know, opt for the bilateral contract. That was here rejected. And the court in Munich somehow had not a problem with this situation. So at the end, the court was indeed inclined to grant an injunction against Ford Berke GmbH. And as a result, Ford Motor Corporation somehow gave up and signed the contract with the Avanci Pool. So we have 50 plus companies who had nothing to do with the patent, nothing to do with the litigation, but they are benefiting from this litigation. This is an impact, to be honest, that you can have with no other patent. If you have a non a classical patent, a non SEP with a genius invention, you would never reach this kind of result. And remember my first transparency, it says friend is a commitment and it limits a bit the impact of such an SEP. You see here, there was no limitation. There was actually the impact much higher than with any other patent. And that was not the end of the story. I mean, this patent, EP737, most likely valid, most likely essential, but not a genius invention, was found in another case, IP Bridge versus HTC, as, you know, likely or very well be exhausted due to a license agreement or not a license agreement, a covenant not to sue or to sue last between Qualcomm and IP Bridge. So this patent should actually not be enforceable in Germany, but not, you know, that was not considered. So this likely exhausted patent with a small invention with uh, maybe validity, maybe essentiality, was leading to the whole success, I would say, of Avanci, because it was not just in the case of uh, IP Rich versus Ford relevant, it was also in the other cases relevant. So this is a situation that's actually, from my perspective, not acceptable. And the EU Commission indeed made the impact assessment, and what they found is really concerning from my perspective. Yeah, here we have, for example, the second bullet that says that there is already proof in the automotive industry that because of SEP royalties, and I mean inflated SEP royalty rates, European suppliers are not longer able to compete and exit the automotive supplier market. I know these competitors, they had good products but they are excluded from the market because of an unfair uh, SAP licensing model. And this is something we should not accept and therefore we need regulation. So that's actually for now all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Ushka, your turn. What do you think about the regulation? Thank you, Igor. Let me also, also share my screen. I also have prepared a small presentation. Can you see my screen? Uh, no, I still see Michael's screen. Oh, sorry, then I... Sorry. And now, now we see you. Okay, good. Great, okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, just a second. I'll... Okay, I guess now you can see the full screen, right? Okay, so first of all, um, thank you very much for having me here. It's always a pleasure to be part of the UI events. Um, I just want to make a disclaimer at the beginning that the opinions and views expressed here are my own and do not necessarily reflect the companies or institutions I work for. So I, well, it was very interesting what I have heard so far, but I would really like to go back to the discussion that Igor outlined at the beginning. So do we have a problem? And has the commission made a proper case? As you know, whenever the European Commission presents a regulation, it needs to show that the market is not, that there is a problem and that the regulation is the best way to address this problem. In economic terms, basically the commission has to show that there is a market failure. So that there are certain inefficiency in the market that market forces will not be able to solve in a reasonable time. And in my view, if you look at the 
public documents that the commission has presented so far, they haven't really shown that this is the case. And in fact, the European Commission says that these agreements about France are likely to increase in the future. But if you look at the empirical evidence, the evidence is really pointing to the other direction. And you don't have to go very far to see this empirical evidence. You can look at the report that has been commissioned by the European Commission and prepared as the basis for the impact assessment. This is the same report that Europe, uh, that Igor pointed to before. And basically this report has looked at France litigation globally and the EU and has concluded that France litigation is decreasing both in absolute and in relative terms. So what does that mean? On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see a graph that shows French litigation globally. You can see that there is a fluctuation over years. A peak was reached in 2014, and since the number of disputes involving France um, disagreements has decreased. 2021 was a historic low for friend disputes. Now, but even if you go back a few years, you see that basically we see this decreasing trend in friend litigation. And they even looked at the divergences between the offer that was made by the SCP holder and implementer and find some indication that these discrepancies, it's shrinking. So there, there seem to be less disagreements. Then the authors, of course, normalize this for patent litigation in general, because one could argue, sure, maybe friend disputes are, are decreasing, but they represent an increasing share of patent litigation more broadly. And they look at this both globally and in Europe, and they didn't find any evidence that SCP litigation is somehow representing a higher share. If anything, as you can see in the graph, is the opposite. Is current litigation is representing an increasingly small, smaller share of patent litigation generally. Then of course, someone can argue, well, looking at litigation is the not, not the right way of looking at it because you know, maybe there are disagreement between parties and they opt to for other market solutions to just avoid this litigation. And the report looks at what is what they called opt out. So they say, well, if there are disagreements between SCP holders and implementer, this should be reflected in their behavior. For example, SCP holders could decide to opt out of the standardization process and just not contribute their technologies anymore or contribute less or be less involved. On the implementer side, implementers could, for example, decide to not implement the standard. They could decide to implement uh, an older generation of the standard, or they could decide to simply delay the implementation. And what the study found is that output is, uh, opt out is more a theoretical possibility than an empirical reality. And in fact, the study describes a market with healthy innovation and wide adoption. So it doesn't really, the empirical evidence doesn't really show that there is some kind of problem in the market. Um, the, the same report, a report also talks extensively about patent litigation globally, problems with bifurcation, different standards for injunction and so on. But these are really problems that seem to apply to patents generally and, not, and are not specific to SCPs. So again, doesn't seem to provide the necessary required evidence to show that there is a problem with SCPs. And then finally, in the impact assessment, the commission talks a lot about SMEs and the problems for SMEs. And I sympathize very much with the commission, you know, with the desire to make sure that the system works for SMEs. That's a legitimate goal. But again, if you look at the impact assessment, it doesn't seem to provide reliable empirical evidence to show that SMEs are facing a problem. There are several anecdotes, but when it comes to a valid empirical basis to show that there is a systematic problem for SMEs, you cannot find it in the impact assessment. As Igor pointed out, the majority of the conclusions are based on a survey 
And this survey covers an extremely small sample of SMEs, about 1% or 1.5. So statistically speaking, can we really rely on this data given that the sample is so small? But even ignoring that, even saying, okay, the sample is enough, you know, Alex said SMEs do not have time to respond. So let's take whatever they have said. Well, even if we do so, still, we don't really see evidence of a systematic problem. The concern is that SMEs do not have the resources or the knowledge to negotiate or to litigate with SCP holders. But at the same time, the impact assessment also recognizes that most SMEs do not have a license or would ever need the license. And in fact, on the first side, the impact assessment recognizes that for most SAP holders, it doesn't make economic sense to license SMEs. And that's because the cost outweighed the expected profit from this licensing. So they don't bother in simple terms to license SMEs. And then based on the survey, the majority of SMEs has said we don't have a license. Only 17% of the responding SMEs said that they have a license. And one third of those SMEs even said, we don't really expect to be ever contacted by the SCP holders to obtain a license. So it is true, SMEs perhaps do not know who the SCP holders are, perhaps do not know how many SCPs that SCP holders have, whether those SCPs are essential, but perhaps they don't need to know because they are not engaged in licensing negotiations and they will never be, and they will never be. They are basically SMEs most of the time are flying under the radar. Now, that being said, of course, that this doesn't mean that, you know, there are no problems in the, in the entire market or that no improvements can be done. Of course, they can be done. But it certainly seems that the European Commission so far has not shown the existence of a type of a problem that would justify a complete overhaul of the SCP licensing. And because of that, I think that when we look at the regulation, it's appropriate to look at the various components of the regulation and see what components are justified because there is, seems to be a general consensus that there is a specific issue and then see what, how the proposed solution would make the status quo better rather than worse. Now, I know that we will discuss the various components of the regulation later on, so I will not go into the, the details of each specific component of the regulation, but just as an example, you know, the regulation contains these provisions concerning, you know, the what I call free advice for SMEs. And I think this is pretty uncontroversial. No one disagrees with that. But other components like essentiality checks, aggregate royalties, and out-of-court grant determination deserve a little bit more scrutiny to make sure that whatever action is taken makes the system better off rather than worse off. And I'll stop here. Thank you, Rushka. And finally, for this uh, opening remarks, Richard, what do you think as a lawyer about this regulation? So, um, yes, a lot of the opening remarks have been uh, <laughs> answered. Most of the questions that you sent around are suggesting. So um, I'll try and keep this short. Um, I am a fan of some sort of um, collective France determination um, system. Um, one of the big problems we have at the moment is that in all of our friend actions or uh, patent related actions we have to go through this first stage of establishing that a patent is valid and infringed and 99% of the time everybody admits that and it's really an argument about what the the licensing terms should be there might be an argument about how strong the portfolio or how weak the portfolio is but we're generally people know that a license is needed so a, a, a process that goes to that core commercial question rather than spending two, three years and millions and millions of euros fighting over whether um, one particular uh, part of the standard is infringed by one particular part of the, uh, infringes one particular part of the patents and all the technical detail, that's, that's probably a step forward. Um, but this regulation, as I was reading it, my thought process was, this would have been very useful back in 2006 when the arguments we were having is, can you even run a FRAND defense? 
can people get interim injunctions when we had judges saying scary things at conferences like the only question I'm interested in is whether you have a license or not. I'm not interested in whether there is some obligation or process by which you might get one. Now, back in those days when we didn't know the answers to any of this, uh, this sort of, you know, the commission uh, intervention of this sort might well have moved us forward. The problem is now we're in 2023, not 2006. We know that you can't get interim injunctions on SEPs. We know that nobody is going to get an injunction on an SEP or take someone off the market when they're faced with a willing licensee. That's shorthand for the, the many different tests that are applied across many courts. Um, we know that the Franz defence works. And we also know that nothing is happening by way of an injunction for one or two or three years down the track with the various appeals and that sort of thing. So the, the, the fears and the threats we faced back in 2006 just aren't there anymore. Um, Professor Contreras started by saying there were a couple of things he liked about it and a couple of things that he, he didn't uh, like about it. And normally I, I agree very, very much with what uh, Jorge says on, on many points. And so I'm going to disagree with him just for the point of argument, which is quite fun. Um, the aggregate royalties point. I completely agree that there is big disagreement about what reasonable aggregate royalty is for LTE in a 300 euro smartphone. That's absolutely right. There are people saying it's 6%. There are people saying it's 10%. There are people saying it's 15%, whatever. But he's absolutely right in that. And somebody answering that question, I think, would probably help everybody. But the problem is the whole aggregate royalty thing was useful back in 2006 when what we were dealing with was cell phones that all had very similar functionality and were all within the sort of price range of 150 to 250 euros. Now, if you're dealing with that very, very narrow category of products, then knowing an, a reasonable aggregate royalty for the device is helpful because then you can start to work out how that is divided amongst other people. The problem today is we're not. Even if you're looking at a $1,300 um, folding Samsung phone all the way down to a $50 uh, um, handset, the concept of a reasonable aggregate royalty for that doesn't work anymore. If you do it in percentage terms, Samsung will scream and say, this is outrageous, I'm paying far, far too much. And most of the functionality of my device is nothing to do with um, the, uh, uh, the, the cellular connectivity. Um, if you do it on per unit and you say the reasonable aggregate royalty on this is 10 euros, Samsung is thinking, this is fantastic. I have to pay hardly anything uh, by way of uh, royalties on my big phone. But the guy who makes the $50 handset is destroyed. So the whole aggregate royalty thing doesn't work anymore, even in the cell phone business. Now export it to a world of IoT where we're arguing over everything from an $80,000 BMW all the way down to a $15 uh, module uh, that's measuring rainfall or uh, depth of water in a well or something like that. It really falls apart. So much as I like the idea that somebody might solve the aggregate royalty problem or question, I don't think that the aggregate royalty question is a valid question anymore. Um, and I think in the world of IoT, it doesn't help anybody. Um, essentiality checks as well. We've There are so many commercial providers who are doing essentiality checks. You have your spoil for choice of whose report that you want to buy and whose data you want to believe. Yet another source of essentiality data is, would have been great back in 2006 today, it's just another source of essentiality data. It doesn't really help anybody. And whatever outcome of this is, somebody else will say, oh, but PA Consulting reached a different answer or OIP Lytics have got a different result. So it, it, it doesn't, again, it just doesn't help us anymore. It's, a, it's yesterday's problem. Mandatory conciliation. So great. I would love the idea that ever we had to go through some sort of third party process before litigation happened. But the problem we have is that this is jurisdiction specific. All this does is slows down patent litigation in Europe. So it slows down the guy who rushes to the German, would otherwise rush to the German court and ask for something. It doesn't have any impact on the people who are rushing to uh, court in Chongqing or Wuhan or Eastern District of Texas, or I'd like to point out for the purposes of selling my own practice in the United Kingdom. Those actions are free to go ahead. So if what the European Commission was intending to do was to cut the German patent litigation industry in half and uh, cut off at the knees that all of the fantastic advantages that were going to be bought by the UPC before it came in uh, and hand all of that work on a plate to the United Kingdom patent profession, it's done a fantastic job. 
I'm not sure that was the intention. Um, I realize I, if this comes in, I probably can't retire for a while because I suspect that we're going to have an awful lot more work our side of the channel. But but, but that, that is the result of making this sort of mandatory conciliation procedure only effective in terms of um, European litigation. What would I change? What would I do differently if this? If you have to have some sort of mandatory or some sort of um, agreed process by which uh, royalties are set, um, to dispute resolution procedure, it's a good thing. One way of doing it would be to write it into the rules of the respective standards and make it global. Don't make it just one country or one region doing something differently from everybody else. So have in there, um, a, for example, have in the Etsy or 3GPP rules um, that the parties will agree to arbitrate um, some sort of France dispute. Um, and uh, if uh, the implementer, if he's intending to enforce the FRAND promise against the patent owner, he's obliged to go through that process as well. That would that would be a good way of doing it. Mr. Justice Arnold wrote a paper suggesting it, and that would work. The other way, or the other rather simpler way of doing it, is to do what the FTC back did back in 2012 with the Goop consent order, where they effectively said that what courts should be doing is recognizing that if you've got a party that declines arbitration, Maybe you should look at that a little bit more carefully. Maybe they are the guy who's being a little bit more abusive. If you have a patent owner who says, I am quite prepared to arbitrate what a friend rate is, um, and the implementer says, oh, no, I do the last thing I want is arbitration to set what rate I should be paying, then maybe, maybe the patent owner should be quicker to get an injunction. Maybe the implementer is being abusive there. If it's the other way around, if the implementer says, I want to arbitrate, I want a fair set rate set for a license, and the patent owner is saying, no, 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 thank you. I, I want to get go straight to my injunction. Then maybe maybe we, we shouldn't be quite so quick to give an injunction. But those those are a couple of the problems I see with it. The, the, the final point, just going back, is that this is this is solving the arguments that we've had a long time ago, and it's not solving the arguments that are coming. I, we, we have our gentleman from Continental here today, Michael, and I've seen also in the audience. And obviously we had that's the licensing level dispute. This doesn't deal with that at all. Um, and, and it can't. And that, that happens to be today's exciting dispute. Tomorrow, there'll be another exciting dispute, which this regulation, again, won't deal with at all. But the fact is, the ingenuity of the people who are working in this industry and the people who are coming up with the arguments far exceeds the capacity of the commission to regulate to keep up with them. And I'm afraid that they're always going to face a losing battle if they're trying to regulate to solve the problems, because the problems they're solving, as we see, are the problems that, that we actually argued about 10, 15 years ago. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, I would like to encourage the audience to ask questions. I see in the chat we have very lively discussion and I'll try late, a bit later to summarize and ask it to the panelists. Uh, but before that, I would like to ask uh, if somebody would like to con continue what Richard did. What do you think you would change in the regulation or you would remove? So what are the things that you would make different in the regulation so anybody wants to give it a try yes i can if you okay, allow me Michael. So, yes but, but first i i would like to 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 yeah to say a few word to, words to richard i mean uh what we have seen in germany is actually injunctions without looking at the friendness of contracts and if i now look at, at the situation in in the uk uh, uh, Interdigital versus Lenovo. I see a high court that, that actually recognizes exactly this problem. Yeah? So you cannot judge about willingness of an implementer if you have no information what's actually friend and if the contract that would be on the table would be friend or not. And so far, I think the regulation is solving exactly this problem because we would have by you know by the use of the the friend determination we would have a data point but what would i improve here i mean what i'm missing is indeed and and i think Jorge already mentioned this is a kind of of transparency and not with respect to uh to the essentiality this is of course an, an important thing but more with you know with a with a view to 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 uh yeah, to, to other license agreements, to comparable license agreements, for example, or to, to the, you know, to the way how a friend uh, determination is done 
uh, in detail, because that's important to know for an implementer to understand if, if the offer he gets is a really friend or not. And the beauty of, of the US court system, and also to a certain degree to in the UK, is indeed that by, by the means of discovery, you can get exactly this information that you need as an implementer to understand if the offer that you get is friend or not. And, and coming back here again to Interdigital versus Lenovo. So we have seen small players, they got a price of 100% and big players, they got a kind of discount in the range of 80%. So this is this is not friend and, and this, this, this needs to be somehow, you know, uh, regulated that, that a small player, and I consider the Apple industry here, by the way, also as a small player compared to Samsung or such big smartphone makers, yeah, that, that, that this industry get evidence and information uh, to, 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 to find out if, if, the, uh, if the offer they have is really friend or not. So this is something that might be improved in the regulation, more transparency with regard to uh, to, to contractual issues. Um, and then another missing element is indeed uh, the, the question of the implementers here. I, I, I mean, I don't find a clear statement about uh, the position of, uh, of the implementers, so uh, about the availability of uh, direct licenses for implementers, but I find it at least implicit in the wording here. So if I read uh, the friend determination, for example, everybody should be uh, entitled to do a friend determination and therefore actually it's a hint in the right direction that uh, also implementers who can make the, you know, or who can initiate friend determination should also be entitled to get a friend contract. Okay, thank you, Michael. I see hands raised. Uh, first, Professor Contreras, Urska, and then Alex. Professor. Great, thank you. Um, so, so a lot, uh, a lot here, and a lot said. And uh, I thank all of my fellow panelists for such uh, interesting and thought-provoking comments. Um, so I'll answer Igor's question. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll also point out two things. Though Richard was was kind enough to um, to to uh, very politely disagree with me, and I, I, I welcome that. That, uh, that that's actually a lot of fun. Um, but I, but I would say, uh, you know, in terms of the aggregate uh, royalties, I I do think that there are two reasons that you can point to where where this uh, works, even in industries where there is a diverse product market. Um, with hugely varying functionality. And uh, pools do this. Um, pools generally have a, a set rate card um, where their technology can be used in a variety of, of contexts. And, and this seems to work fine, um, at, on a, even on a percentage royalty basis. And uh, But if you look even beyond that, I mean, most of the electronics industry for the last century around the world has operated on a component fixed price basis, right? You buy a transistor, um, whether you're going to put it in the you know $500 million airplane or the $20 radio, it's still the same transistor, right? And so we don't need to obsess with the value of the end product when we're talking about a component. I, I can see a world where it's perfectly reasonable to have a Wi-Fi chip um, that costs X dollars uh, and that's it. And we don't need to worry about what the ultimate uh, value of the product in which it's going is. So I, I think there are ways that this can be useful. But anyway, I, I want to respect Igor um, and answer his question. I was like, so I would, I would change, I would propose four types of tweaks to particularly the FRAN rate determination parts of the EU's proposal. Um, one is transparency, as others have mentioned. I think that it would be, it's more beneficial for the industry if everything that this uh, governmental panel determines is non-confidential. This is often what happens with governmental uh, rate setting and governmental determinations. I think that the public has a right to see what happens in governmental proceedings. Um, and so I would make it all public and transparent. I would also make it a collective activity and not just a bilateral dispute re uh, resolution mechanism. I would bring in other stakeholders and take evidence from all interested stakeholders 
as opposed to just the two parties to the dispute. I would also add some level of binding effect on the parties. I mean, even though I know the commission can't directly intervene uh, and interfere with the national court proceeding, it can bind parties in some way with respect to contractual um, uh, uh, commitments and so forth. And so a little bit more than the completely non-binding effect I think would be beneficial. And then finally, um, I'm, and I'm very surprised the commission did not propose this given the EU's complaint in the WTO, I think there should be some discouragement of anti-suit injunctions being issued in other countries to prevent um, rate setting or proceedings on friend uh, controversies in the EU. I think that would be very much in line with uh, many of the US proposals. And I think it's a perfectly fair thing for a jurisdiction to do in this context. So that's what I would change among the pieces that I, I otherwise think are productive steps forward. Thank you, Urushka. Thank you. I first just wanted to uh, respond to the comment about German courts. An argument that we hear very often is the German courts don't really look at whether the, an offer that has been made is friend. And I'm always surprised by this statement because in my previous life, I was working in economic consulting and we were involved in litigation in Germany. And we were asked to opine on whether an offer is friend. So it is a question that German courts do address in some cases. Now I have, as part of my work, I have view many decisions by German courts, and there are certainly cases in, in which the court does not uh, go into the question whether the, uh, the offer is friend, but it's typically because the court has looked at the evidence and have seen that the behavior of the implementer is so egregious that the implementer is clearly unwilling to enter into a license agreement on front terms. And there are many examples available. There are many cases where the implementer has not even responded to the SCP holder offers for years until sued in court. And the court said, well, that's not acceptable. There are cases in which the implementer was engaging in, in a negotiation, but not really, not really improving or not really billing being really willing to find an agreement. For example, the court found that the implementer was repeatedly asking for information that had been already provided or was arguing that the offer was not frank, but then when the court said, okay, can you present what is the basis for your belief that the offer is not frank, the implementer was not able to provide any type of evidence. There are even cases when the SCP holder executed over 2000 licenses on the same terms and the implementer said that the um, offer was not friend. So in these very extreme cases, the court said, well, I won't bother even to look at comparable licenses. And I think that the injunction is appropriate here. But there are cases when you know the SCP holder and the implementer will look at comparable licenses, the court will analyze. And so it's, I don't think it's accurate to say that German courts do not look at whether the offer is friend. Now, that putting aside with respect to your question, Igor, I think it's, at least from my perspective, it's a bit early to say, you know, what fixes could be added to the regulation. I think it's important to take a step back and realize whether, you know, where is the problem, you know, and do we need a regulation? Maybe it's not an answer yes or no. Maybe there are parts of the regulation that should go forward and could be improved, but other that maybe are not necessarily and should not be addressed through a regulation. Okay, thank you, Roshka. And uh, Alex, so do you have any comments on what was said? Yeah, sure. On those, your um, views, what would you change? Yeah, I'd like to respond firstly to Roshka and then to, to Richard, and then I'll get to my points. But although I must say that uh, Michael and Professor Contreras took the words right out of my mouth when it comes to changes. Um, Ishka, you brought up the SMB's point again. Um, and you said that, for example, well, the big guys don't really go after this after SMEs. And uh, that doesn't preclude small patent assertion entities using a small portfolio to go after these small guys. This happens all the time. I have members coming up to me all the time saying that 
this is happening to them. Two, two, two times it happens the most is after a funding round. So they make a they make the mistake of making a press release saying we just raised 50 million euros through venture capital, and the next week they get letters from patent assertion entities. The second one is by making the mistake of going to trade fairs to try and advertise their new innovations. Patent assertion entities also go to those trade fairs, and next week they get letters saying, "Give us money." So it's not that the it's not saying that the big guys don't go after the after after SMEs. They don't, perhaps, but small companies with small portfolios do go after SMEs all the time. And to Rick Pitt's point, you said, well, this would be good in 2006. Um, maybe the regulation is just really long overdue. And, you know, it would have been good in 2006, but, you know, that's not an ex saying it was good then, but it's not needed now. It's, I don't think that's an excuse to say we shouldn't have the regulation now. I'm now, uh, the, the courts had, had caught up and overtaken and solved the problem. Well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, now, in terms of what would I, I would change, um, and I'd be really careful here to say that these are my personal views, yeah, because we're still within FSA assessing what what needs to be changed. Um, I think when it comes to the injunctions issue, I think it would be a lot better to just have a four factor test, like an eBay, if they could just put that straight into the regulation. It would have been really good because you would have courts actually assessing the proportionality of whether an injunction should be granted or not. Um, it prob probably even would have been better than just having a, a nine month period without litigation. But we'll take the, I'll take the nine month um, for determination process so that parties actually have a chance to sit down and negotiate without the threat of an injunction. Um, and I, Michael said it before, but I, it was really unfortunate for me at least to see that in the earlier draft, leaked draft, there was a specific reference to the fact that anybody should be able to get a license if they're willing to take one. Um, and it was unfortunate that that was taken out. I can understand why they did it, but I would prefer, prefer that feedback in there. So, thanks. And thanks. Come, maybe one, 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 yes. uh, one statement from my side. I mean, uh, that, that, that European or German judges uh, consider the friendness of the contract. This is, at least in my experience, is, it's, it's unfortunately not true. And, and many judges, European judges, have repeatedly stated that patent infringement proceedings, and that's what we had in the auto industry, you know, so I counted 50 uh, until the success of Avanci, that these patent infringement pro proceedings are not made to determine friend terms. Yeah, and they have said over and over again that parties should go somewhere else, like arbitration, for example, to figure out what's actually friend. And this is now, you know, a proposal from the EU Commission to, to establish in the EU IPO a competence center that exactly that does what German judges, for example, in Munich, would like to see. So data points and information, what's actually friend, because they don't do this. They look maybe at comparable license agreements if they exist, but sorry, uh, the Avanci license agreements, especially those who came up under the pressure of injunction, these are not comparable license agreements. Uh, and therefore, it would help the German judges to, 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 to speed up their process because indeed, of course, the, 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 you know, the, the question here, the most important question is, is the friendness, not the infringement, not the validity of the patents. We agree that in 4G and in 5G, we will have, and yeah, we will have uh, essential and, and, and also valid patents. That, that's no question. But the problem here is the friendness. And from my perspective, and this is easy to prove, even by the arguments from Nokia and the methodology by from Nokia, we can easily prove that the $20 from, from Avanci are not friend. But that's now the reality, non-friend contracts due to the fact of injunctions. The, um, the, the, the auto industry is an interesting survey, uh, study though. Um, and particularly that Daimler case, the, the, the first Daimler cellular connected vehicle was made in 2008. It's not until, it's not 13, until 13 or 14 years later that Mercedes actually takes the license to the, to the technology that it's using. And when you consider the, the average life of a patent is 20 years and it takes probably three, four years for a standard to, to become commercially available. 
you, you have to start to worry that was there really such an injunction threat on Mercedes? Were they really so terrified that they agreed yes. to sign up to a yes. super yes, fine group when, when they'd operated 14 years without a license at all? Look, I, look, the, 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 look what, the, what, the, what the regulation doesn't do at all is speed up the process of taking the license from that side. And I think we would all uh, agree that a fast dispute resolution process by which we get to a, a license would be fantastically useful for the industry. We have we have a system where people start infringing, start using the technology before they take a license, which is the opposite to the music world. You take the license first, and then only then do you start using the, the music. Um, in that, so so we need to speed it speed it up in in both respects. Um, it, it's it's not enough just to make things more and more against the patent owner when when really a lot of the problems are coming from the, the delay in taking the license to up. We don't do this. Sorry, sorry, Richard. We don't do this. Mercedes is using Canvas for a long, long time and they have I'm a sorry, license. I'm not saying it's continental. I don't know. No, no, no. I, no, no, no. I, I say the auto industry. The auto well. industry is using Canvas, which is a standard in the auto industry, royalty bearing with friend conditions, and we had no litigation. So you say Mercedes is using uh, this LTE since 14 years, didn't take a license. For what reason? Because the offer was not friend. If the offer would be friend, they would have taken the license or we would have taken the license directly. So that's the problem. And we need here the process which gives us guidance and sorry, nine months. This is fast, this is extremely fast compared to the litigation in the auto industry that took four years and 50 cases or compared to the situation in UK or US in which also a friend determination takes years. So I nine months is from my perspective fast. <laughs> I, I agree that it needs to be quicker. The UK is too slow. <laughs> Uh, I would like to raise one question from the audience, which uh, dominated the chat a bit. And uh, it's a technical question, but I would like to see if anybody would like to take a shot. So the question was, if I can summarize it, about essentiality checks. And if a person would like to do essentiality check, it would look at a patent and needs to go into claim construction. But different countries have different standards, different laws about claim constructions. They vary a bit. So which law would apply to claim construction conducted at the EU IPO? And then you have different conflicts between perhaps German claim construction and Spanish claim construction. So did anyone care thought about this issue? Would anyone like to go? I'll, I'll make a slightly controversial view. The level of accuracy at which these assessments is going to be done is, is going to be it's going to be relatively quick and dirty. Um, and that's fine and that's useful in itself. But at that level of accuracy, it doesn't really matter whether you apply a German approach to claim construction or a French or an English approach to claim construction. They are they're within the error margins that already exist by the inherent inaccuracy in the, in the process. I, I shouldn't, I'm not criticizing the process. I'm not saying that a, a quick and dirty assessment is, is useless in all circumstances. And we certainly can't spend a million euros arguing over the claim construction of each patent. Um, but I think that this is a, a, a question that in, in reality probably won't much matter. Uh, thank you. Anybody else or should they move on? No, uh, Michael. With, with regard to essentiality checks, I mean, there is a big discussion around this, but for me as an implementer, this kind of essentiality information is most important in a situation in which I have a conflict, in which I do not accept the offer for example, for a bilateral contract, and I say, look, uh, you estimated your share in the SCP is too high, and this, and this, and this. So here I need the information. In the moment in which the offer as such is friend, I am actually not so much worried about, you know, the actual uh, actual essentiality or not. This is this is one thing. And the other thing is that that essentiality checks are actually 
already existing. If whenever I talk to Avanzi, like to, to Lori, they tell me they do essentiality checks. So that means, and, and also if I look at the 5G uh, business review letter that says, look, you only have the right to offer complementary patents. So that needs, or that, that, that there is a need for an essentiality check. And this essentiality checks have to be financed or budgeted by the SEP owner so far, because Avanzi will not do this for free. So SEP owners obviously invest in essentiality checks, for example, at Avanzi. If there's already some money available for this kind of checks, maybe it makes sense to reallocate this to the EU IPO simply to have an independent third party doing the check. Okay, now I would like to go to aggregate royalty rates. So in my own personal view, I could imagine a system that it would be beneficial to know the ultimate price of the standard. But reading the regulation, I'm not sure if the regulation will come to this price. So as I said, there can be different groups of SAP owners, just two of them having their different views on aggregate royalty. Then there is the conciliation and this non-binding expert opinion. So to my mind, I can imagine a situation where we have, for example, 10 groups of SAP owners having different views about aggregate royalty and this non-binding expert opinion, again, different view. So is this adding actually more confusion than certainty? Anybody wants to comment? Yes, Jorge? Um. Yeah, I mean, Igor, that that's clearly a, a risk. Uh, but I mean, I would I would hope that in implementing this proposal, the EU appoints to this conciliation board people who are qualified and neutral. Um, and in the proposed regulation in this uh, aggregate royalty determination, they they do have the authority to collect evidence from others than the parties who were before them, which I think is the important piece, right? So if, if the conciliators are trying to do a good job and trying to do the right thing, they have the authority to seek evidence from all interested stakeholders, both SEP holders and implementers, which I think you need if you're going to have any kind of rational aggregate royalty because yeah of course this is why this hasn't worked well in bilateral litigation you you just have two parties throwing out their opinions without hearing from the rest of the industry so i i would give the uh, you know these conciliators a a chance to show that they are willing to do the work um to get it right thank you alex yeah well i think Again, I have to stress uh, that this is my personal view because FSA doesn't have a position yet on this part of the regulation. But in my personal view, I, like I think the aggregate royalty rate has a lot of benefits. And I, as Professor Contreras said, I think we have to give the EU IPO a chance to prove its worth. Um, the fact that it's going to be an independent third party um, who's going to do this is, is a welcome step, right? Um, but I think... The biggest benefit of the aggregate royalty rate, especially for new companies who are coming, who are for the first time adopting connectivity standards in particular, it's being able to know your costs upfront and being able to make an informed decision on, okay, if I implement LTE or whatever category of LTE, how much is it actually going to cost me? And you can make an assessment by looking at, okay, well, how much is Wi-Fi going to cost me? Or is there another standard I could use? Having those costs upfront is so much better than implementing a standard without knowing that down the line you're going to have to you're going to be charged royalties uh, which you haven't factored into your into your business plan and you could say well you, they should have done that but that the, the, the market is so intransparent at the moment it's such it's so chaotic you can't expect any com well you can't expect small companies in particular to really take into consideration those those costs. So a publicly available aggregate royalty rate known upfront is is a is really useful, I think, for, for, for new companies. And it's also very difficult for 
big companies simple to simply to make accruals because whenever you make accruals in a big company you have to explain why and what could you accrue you can also or you can just accrue what what you in your view see as a friend rate you you cannot be you know over cautious and say okay i i actually see one dollar as a friend rate but but for you know for for the sake of, of being on the safe side i will accrue five dollar that's simply not possible and in so far it would be really beneficial not just for the small companies also for the big companies to know in advance what would be the aggregate royalty rate at least roughly that they would be able to, 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 to react accordingly and also to build up, you know, the business accordingly, because that also needs to end up in, 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 in the bill of material or bill of licenses. So in so far, it, it would help to have information and guidance on the aggregate royalty rate. I have a lot of sympathy with Michael's point there about the, uh, the difficulty of accruing. And I remember from my own existence, trying to work out what it was we needed to accrue uh, against sales in order to pay uh, licensing demands that were going to come in. Um, the, the the other problem, though, of course, is that when you have competing standards, we now have a, a, a third party body that is setting what is effectively the price of one standard as against another. And I'm going to be interested in the, you know, what what we do what we do from a competition law point of view, point uh, complaints when let's say that one, one standard is set with a, a royalty rate of 10% and another a, an aggregate royalty rate of 8%. Is there then going to be a, a complaint by the, the owners of patents in the 10% standard to say that they have been uh, artificially, um, well, disadvantaged by this price being set for their competing standard that's now at a lower rate? It's an area where we've stopped letting the market set the rate and we've suddenly started imposing rates, which uh, will disadvantage some people against another. And I am not a competition lawyer, but I can see that there's going to be some interesting arguments um, when, when and if that happens. Um, yeah, Igor, may I? Yes, please. Well, first of all, I would question actually whether, you know, having knowledge of the aggregate royalty is really a problem or it's more of a talking point. Uh, you know, there are many industries where you don't know exactly the cost that you will face, face and still these industries work. But the Avance example, I think is pretty telling, right? Avance did announce the $15 royalty for its pool. Yet, this did not preclude these agreements, you know, or even litigation. In fact, we have heard Michael saying, I don't believe this is France. So it's not the knowledge about the aggregate royalty. There are other issues that arise, like it's the price fair or licensing level was another dispute. So I'm not sure that providing information about the aggregate royalty is really what will solve the dispute. Then there is also a more practical question of how will this work in practice? Let's assume that SCP holders agree on aggregate royalty. There are no disagreements, they announce it. What will happen there? Will court use this aggregate royalty or will they think that it's self-serving and therefore shouldn't have too much weight? And then maybe if they don't agree and we have this administrative body determining the, uh, the aggregate French royalty, I agree with Jorge that we should trust them, right? That they will try to provide an accurate number. But, you know, 5G, I think it, it has around 50,000 declared SCPs. Uh, uh, so, you know, how likely it is that an administrative body with limited experience in this field will be able to have an accurate estimate about the aggregate royalty. So really in practical terms, can we really expect them to, to be able in a short time to determine the aggregate royalty that is fair and balanced? And I think the elephant in the room is then that this aggregate royalty is really used for a top-down approach as Jorge mentioned it earlier. And you know, the top-down approach has been discussed a lot in the academic literature, but it hasn't been truly really used by courts. It has been rejected many times. We had 
Microsoft v. Motorola, where the court discussed the top-down approach, but ultimately did not implement it. We have Innovasha that is now 10 years old, where the court adopted the top-down methodology. And then we have TCL v. Ericsson, a decision that was ultimately vacated by the federal circuit. So in the US, we have one case that is 10 years old. I believe there was also a decision in, in Japan, also quite old, and there are several recent court decisions that have rejected the top-down approach on a standalone basis for as a methodology to use a valuation of rent royalties. And there are clear reasons why. First, because it's difficult to identify uh, an aggregate royalty that correctly reflects the value of all technologies implemented in the standard. But even assuming that you can do that, you know, it's difficult to then apportion correctly to the value of individual port portfolios. At, as Michael pointed out earlier, there are some patents that really cover just marginal inventions and they don't deserve much of a compensation. There are others that cover very, very important uh, breakthrough innovations and those should be compensated more. So, and in a top-down methodology, very often courts have no other choice than rely on patent counting, which has been lo long acknowledged in the academic literature to not be a reliable method for valuing patent portfolio. Even worse, they can rely on contribution counting. So the risk is that this aggregate royalty will be then misused to adopt some form of valuation methodology that is not accurate and that actually undervalues true innovation and overcompensates innovation of marginal value. Anybody wants to comment? If not, uh, I would like to move on and we are going slowly to the end of, of this webinar. But to me, very interesting is or are geopolitical dimensions. So I know Professor Contreras may tell us a bit about the US Act, which is planned to have SCP royalty tribunals. And if we imagine that there is an EU regulation, SCP tribunals in the US, Maybe China also adopts its own system. So do you see there is a danger of having these different regulatory regimes and moving the disputes from courts to regulators? So what do you think about this, the Brussels effect and actually having different countries the same regulation? So Professor Contreras, please tell us about the US. Uh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, so as you point out, there is legislation that um, uh, has been proposed in the US, certainly not adopted, not even officially introduced, but, but certainly floating around in committees that would create some sort of SEP royalty tribunal, um, which would have binding effect in the US and would also disregard um, SEP royalty determinations for U.S. patents that are made outside of the U.S. And this, this is a trade measure. Um, it's, it's explicitly directed at uh, China and what Chinese courts have been doing um, with the potential to set global rates. Um, and you're right that I, well, I don't know, but, but uh, you know, that then next has come this EU uh, proposal and it's highly likely that others will follow. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. Um, after all, patents are creatures of national law. The default scenario, what we've all grown up with, uh, as we learned a lot, is that you litigate your patents in the countries where they're issued. So we already have you know, separate uh, determinations. Now, uh, is it a problem that these are agencies rather than courts uh, making this determination? I, I mean, in the, the U.S. version would defers this to U.S. courts. So I think that's a good way to do it. You know, as long as within the internal national uh, legal system of the country, it supports an administrative determination uh, over a court determination, I, I think that's fine. I think in China, it probably would. Uh, be supported in Europe? I don't know. I, I'll leave that to the European experts, right? But my ultimate, ultimate hope 
in all of this is that this proliferation of nationalistic uh, determinations will just drive parties to global rate determinations uh, through some kind of arbitration or will at least drive countries or WIPO or somebody to set up a viable global rate setting board that can then with the, uh, with the agreement of all of the parties set these global rates and we can avoid all of these different national systems, whether it's courts or uh, agencies. Um, I mean, I think the end game here ought to be a global rate that's set by a body that takes evidence from all of the interested parties. Um, so that well, that's my view. One of the um, problems with setting up a new tribunal or a new thing every time we come up with a, a dispute is that we end up with a large proliferation of tribunals, which becomes somewhat inefficient. We This isn't the first international trade dispute or issue that's arisen, and it certainly won't be the last. And we, we have developed a system of international arbitration for dealing with disputes between companies from foreign countries or disputes that uh, have a, a global impact. Um, and it does work. Uh, we've done, certainly whilst I was at Nokia, we did arbitrations of rates against LG and against Samsung um, and a, a smaller uh, arbitration against BlackBerry. Um, and they did, they did work, they did produce results. And importantly also, they were scaled. So when you have Nokia versus Samsung, both sides were able to spend an enormous amount of money on a huge dispute and um, have a very, very long hearing. When it was Nokia against BlackBerry, it was much, much smaller. Um, it was a much smaller, quicker hearing, and it was much cheaper. And international arbitration has that flexibility to scale with the size of the dispute. And I, I wonder if rather than creating more and more and more tribunals every time we come up with another problem, why don't we push the, the, the problems into the existing set of international tribunals that we already have? Um, and the, the system that works. The great advantage of that is there have been so many arbitrations now over the last 50, 70 years or whatever, the rules are pretty well established um, and pretty well understood and the pools of arbitrators are pretty well established. It's, uh, I, it's a, a system that I think we should encourage more use of rather than creating a new tailor-made tribunal every time we come up with a new problem. Thank you, Alex, and then Jorge. Yeah, I mean, I'll speak to the the, the point about you know, concerns around, as you say, could say regulatory fragmentation. Um, look, I, many com many countries are already looking at the ACP issue you know, at large anyway, right? We've got consultations going on in the UK. You've got China looking at this. You've got India, and as Professor Contreras said, the US. So, you know, countries are already looking at this, and I don't think that should preclude the EU setting its own system right it's we're in a world now where the eu has clearly said they want to be you know an independent actor on the global stage etc so i think it's a part of that general trajectory i just want that was that was my point oh, can i can also say about the arbitration point which uh richard raised i mean i think one of the concerns around arbitration really is about the lack of transparency and when you talk about the SUP market in general, there is a lack of transparency around, around many issues. So having it with an independent third party in the EU, where there is at least a little bit more transparency around how these rates are being set, and et cetera, et cetera, that's better than I think what the system that we have now. So hence, hence the that's, use of the EU IPO. So that, that, that's a fair point actually. Um, and the way I, the, the transparency thing is not really the fault of the dispute re resolution mechanism. Um, you could, I, I think you can either have a perfectly transparent market in which everything's public, and that's great, that works very well. House prices in the UK, you can look at uh, any website and see what your neighbour paid for his house, and therefore you can set your house prices. That's, that, that works very well. Or you can have a perfectly opaque market. The UK rental market is perfectly opaque. You, you can't see what your neighbour is paying for rent. Where the problem comes is where a little bit of information is out there, and particularly where some guys have more information than others. Um, and so partial transparency is always a bad thing. We either have a, a transparent or we have opaque. At the moment, we have we have opaque and attempts to make it a little bit more transparent actually just make the problem worse rather than better. Surely the EU IPO, though, having access to all of the arbitrations it will do, it will develop its own internal expertise 
And so at least it's housed in one place. You know, and today we will know exactly what the royalty rate is for UMTS. And that's great. But what we won't know is what the royalty rate is for 5G, which is what we're worrying about. So that's, this is the, the, the problem. If, if, if we have that, then everybody publishes everything. Um, and, you know, every deal that's entered is put on a public register. And that would be a, another way of doing it. And it would also stop the big guys from forcing the really, really favorable deals um, and using their market power to do that because everybody will be able to see that they've driven a, um, a little patent owner into a subprime deal. Um, so that's that's possible, I agree, but but I, th- I think it has to be either one or the other. But the, the sort of the, the the halfway in the middle doesn't work. It's it's worse for everybody. Yeah, so on the arbitration point, um, you know, I, I, I Alex is absolutely right. The transparency is an issue, but but another issue is the um, the collective nature of it, right? So bilateral arbitrations today they. They are done and they're efficient uh, for the parties who are involved in them. Um, but for a number of reasons, some parties don't trust that procedure. And you know, I would I would differ with I, I, I it might have been Richard <laughs> I've forgotten from all of the previous comments who uh, pointed I think to the very nice FTC uh, consent decree in Google back in 2012. Um, which uh, encouraged private arbitration of these disputes. So that, that, that didn't happen in a big way. We still get a lot of litigation. And one of the reasons I hear for that is because some parties, um, you know, they, they, they believe that the arbitration system is geared towards splitting the baby and, you know, fairly or not, um, that, that a court is going to come up with a more accurate um, rate and, and is going to have at its disposal greater tools to uh, solicit evidence from the field. And that, that might be true. You know, it, it, we've had now 11 years when parties could have more broadly embraced this idea of going to private arbitration and, and they didn't. And so even though WIPO and you know, AAA, and now I know UPC, all of these various bodies will have set up um, FRAND uh, uh, determination boards or subsets within their their groups, you know, they're not going to get as much usage as a government mandated body would, which is where, you know, I think the EU has taken the next step here um, in this nudge toward resolving these disputes through it's not arbitration, but at least it'll throw a number out there. And I think I think the government had to step in and do something like this because the private parties weren't really doing it as often as they might. It, I totally agree. It's the number. So we need orientation. That's that's the point. And and in in so far, I I I'm very sympathetic with with Richard's Rich, 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 Rich proposal to 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 make it transparent to make it not something in the middle to make it fully transparent that everybody knows all the facts and can based on these facts assess what 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 would be friend or not so that that would help the industry and it would make licensing more smooth and 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 that's i think that's the goal for all of us for for the implementers as well as for for the scp owners to come up uh soon enough with contracts that are working and that are accepted and and that's it then 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 we would have solved the problem and and i think the regulation the draft regulation is going right in this direction and that helps us and and i hope that it will not be diluted but uh, the the draft will at a certain time become a law and helps us in the industry to facilitate facilitate uh, truly friend friend agreements the, the problem with the regulation is it can't of itself achieve perfect transparency. Um, it can only sort of lift the curtain in a couple of places. And um, so the, 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 if you're going to go for a perfectly transparent standard system, then that really has to be written into the standards uh, agreement at the beginning. And you'll have some that are perfectly transparent and some that are perfectly opaque. Um, a, a, a regional um, thing that only looks at one or two people is is only it makes the problem it seriously disadvantages one or two and what everyone's afraid of is this that, that it's them that gets seriously disadvantaged igor mary just comment. yes please please 
please. So I do completely agree with the other panelists that it would be naive to expect that, you know, the EU will serve this administrative body and other jurisdiction will not follow the example of the EU. Uh, it's way more likely that they will do the same thing. And in fact, as Alex pointed out, we have already seen actions in other jurisdictions, including India, China, the US. So what though I think is the outcome is that ironically at the beginning of this panel, we have heard concerns about forum shopping, about divergent court decisions, and we will end up with the same thing, you know, <laughs> we will end up with forum shopping, but the only difference now, it will be that we will be in administrative procedure rather than in court. So out of court rather than in court. And if you believe in the rule of law, I'm not sure this is the outcome that you want. So far, the regulation doesn't really clarify how it will be implemented. You know, it's not clear what are the procedural rules, what is the burden of proof? What is the standard of proof? Is there an appeal process? And without this clarification, there is a risk that these administrative procedures, either in the EU or in other countries, will become just a massive lobbying competition, right? If there are no procedural rules, procedural safeguards, then it will be just lobbying. And we know that it comes to lobbying, then the largest companies that have most fun to fund lobbying activities will be the winners, not SMEs. So I think the European Commission should, be, should keep this in mind when uh, working on the regulation and make sure the procedural rights of the parties are protected and to ensure that the procedure is fair so that it's similar solutions are adopted in other jurisdictions cannot be abused. But, but the regulation takes care of exactly this. I mean, uh, we have, for example, the friend determination. And when this determination is, you know, finished, so terminated, then all all the measures in front of the courts are again open. So it's not that 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 you have something binding. It's all non-binding. It's a data point. It's information. But if you are not happy with this outcome, of course, you are allowed to go to the court in Munich or to a court in Paris and do something next to, to you know, get further information from the courts. And they but, might be binding Michael at the end. This will not have make the licensing negotiation more efficient. If anything, it will prolong them by nine months. If we want this procedure to be the one that solves the problem, this is the procedure where parties need to have their procedural right. And you know the procedure needs to be structured in a way to produce the most accurate and fair result possible. Saying, well, even if you're not happy, you can go to court, then why bother with this new procedure? Because we need a data point. And this data point, and we had this in the beginning of the discussion, this data point will have a value. So looking at the court in Munich, if Judge Sigan gets the data point A and the SCP owner says, oh, I'm not happy, I sue for infringement and my contract that I am offering uh, is 10 times A, then Judge Sigan will have a hard time to find the implementer as unwilling when the implementer says, I'm happy and I'm, you know, I, 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 I feel bound to the outcome of the uh, proceedings in front of the uh, EU IPO and vice versa. So this, this helps. This helps the community to, to come up with solutions very, very fast and soon. And especially when, when this uh, competence center develops, you know, competence. And I, I, I believe they will do so because they will focus on SEPs, mostly while courts, for example. I mean, Judge Sigan is not just doing this, this, this SEP or, or infringement cases. He is doing something else. So if you have... Uh, a competence center that, that collects information and that, that, you know, thinks about this issue mostly and, and all the time, then, then you will create competence soon and, and you will get good outcomes from, 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 from the competence center. I'm pretty convinced. Because well, I would like to believe procedure. so, but you know, you don't know who will lead this competence center and you cannot just leave it to the chance. You need to have procedural safeguards to ensure that this is the case, that, you know, decisions are based on evidence. If the decision does not reflect the evidence that you have, you know, the right to have a peer review as for essentiality checks or things like that, I don't think we should have we should just have 
faith, you know, you know, yeah, they will do a good job. You need to have procedural rules to ensure that. But I know you are we are running out of time. We are running out of time. And thank you for all the debate. I want to ask just one quick question from the audience, and it's a very interesting one. And it is about people who will be doing evaluators, conciliators. So these people have to have special knowledge about technology, SAP licensing, brand, especially the evaluators who do essentiality check. And the question is, where will these people come from? How many do we have? Many may have conflicts of interests. So especially if they will be doing annually essentiality check. So it's ongoing process. So how to find so many people, experts who are non-conflicted. So any thoughts about that? I think that's a legitimate uh, point. I, the way that you've described it, Igor, it sounds like Plato's Republic, a group of people with expert knowledge who can take care of everything. Um, yeah, I, I'll just kick this one, this can down the road. But I think, yeah, I, <laughs> I think there's a legitimate point to make. It, yeah. Let's I, just hope that they can find them. Realistically, anyone you want to uh, assessing the essentiality of a patent is somebody who's got some industry experience, and they're going to have come from industry on one side or the other. It's it's very difficult. Anyone who's got no connections to the industry probably hasn't got the experience to to determine it. So we're we're going to have uh, we're not going to be able to find people who are independent but experienced. But then you have to mix them from both sides. Yes. Uh, so it, it has to yeah. be one from the implementer side, one from the SCP owner side, mix them, and then they have to argue, they have to, to, to find solutions based on the evidence. So Ushka, you are completely right. We need evidence. Uh, it, it's not just a gut feeling. We are, But for the moment, I mean, if I look at to the Munich court, so they don't deal with evidence about you know, friendness of contracts or something. I, I really have seen proceedings and, and also, you know, discussions in the courtrooms, which actually had nothing to do with friendness, to be honest. Yeah, and, and here in the competence center, you would mix people, of course, they, they are, you know, biased in one way and the other way. But if you mix them together, maybe at the end, you get a fair outcome. And, and I the, think answer, that, the, sorry, answer is to not, the answer is to anonymize the patents. You know, even if you have got some ex Nokia guy, if he doesn't know whose patent it is, he's looking at them. Yeah. I think the commission has proposed some sort of code of conduct, which the conciliators will have to abide by and presumably hope that will, uh, yeah, try and make the, the, the conciliators a bit um, less partial. Oh, thank you very much. We have run out of time. I would like to thank you for this amazing discussion and the final word, words by our director, Pierluigi. Uh, yes, thank you, Igor. Uh, okay, uh, let me say a couple of words about this discussion. Uh, the discussion was extremely interesting and uh, clearly is an opening, I mean, is an opening because the regulation, the proposal is new, but uh, there is a lot of background, obviously, in this discussion. If I have to step back a second about these issues that were discussed, I see at least five things I want to uh, work on in the next uh, weeks, uh, months, uh, maybe also as a comment to the uh, request of comments by the commission. Uh, the first thing is uh, uh, if uh, these are technical, legal problems or also economical problems, I want to try to get uh, some more uh, work on the uh, on the way different way in which this discussion uh, will be approached the use of this the importance of this regulation the second thing that comes out of the discussion that is interesting for me is if europe gets stronger uh, or no respect to the rest of the world coming up with a with a, a regulation like this when Europe did the GDPR, somehow people say, well, that could be a model. Then there is a different opinion. Somebody say no, but this will slow down uh, the data use. But however, there is an important issue. With DMA, there is the same discussion somehow. Trying to regulate uh, the digital uh, markets is, is uh, the right choice. I think this regulation needs the same kind of discussion at some point about understanding what will be is a strategic effect. 
Then a third dimension is uh, this uh, attempt to regulate uh, better uh, SEPs and the standardization process in a sense. Uh, will strengthen it or will move more on proprietary models? I think Igor mentioned this issue at the beginning. I think it's one of, it's one of the issues I always uh, think about respect to the models of innovation. So I think it's important also to go further in this. More uh, simply, this will simplify things or will complicate things? That's one question I'm, I ask always when I see a new regulation. This regulation asks for a lot of notifications, let's say, and then checks and the sociality checks and so on. Uh, this will in the end simplify the world or will complicate it. And not uh, in something else that they want to look into and uh, obviously connected. Can this bring to more litigation or to less litigation? Obviously it's based on the idea that to solve the litigation to create a common ground, but will or, or will bring a litigation, maybe as somebody was suggesting somewhere else, will export litigation from Europe. I don't know if this could be an element. So anyway, these are all uh, possible themes uh, that uh, I think will be uh, discussed more. As I said, I stepped back and I didn't want to enter in the merit of the moment of the, of the regulation, but clearly we'll need to, to uh, do a further, deba further debates on this. And I think maybe uh, seeing also the, the depth of this discussion, we could have a next debate in which we will try to see the things on which we all agree. What are the things that can improve things? And we mostly agree. And then let the things that are more difficult for a further uh, reflection. Anyway, as a group of research, uh, we plan also to create, to write down an opinion uh, on this, uh, on a comment on this regulation, try to contribute to the discussion. But uh, let me stop here. Let me thank uh, particularly Igor for this organization, my team for the organization of this debate. Let me thank all the speakers. It was uh, been a, an excellent, uh, interesting, informative, and also uh, controversial debate, but very, very interesting and very, very nice. And let me also thank uh, uh, the 100 plus people that uh, were spent two days uh, in a Friday afternoon to listen to this discussion. It shows that people are interested in understanding. Thank you very much to all. Thanks. Thank you.